Okay, so here it is. If you're a small business owner, there's a lot of us out there in the country, myself included. If you're a small business owner who's been thinking that at some point down the road, you might want to transition out of the business, whether it's selling to your partners, selling, transitioning to a family member, or selling to a third party, an outside party. Um, all of those things were what we just got done talking about in our podcast here in the studio yesterday. Now, full disclosure, I was so excited about this. The first time we ever had five people in the studio at once, thought I had a handle on it, but two of our cameras cut out about halfway through this. So Ben Denall and myself, I apologize to Ben. Uh, his camera shut off, but his knowledge, he kept dropping knowledge the whole way through. So um, we have Bob McCormack, who does business valuations. We had Paul, attorney Paul Rushton, who uh, does a lot of these deals year in and year out. We had one of my partners from Stonehouse, another advisor, Scott Stone. Um, and we had Ben Denault, the CPA that's involved, um, CEO basically of our accounting firm. And it was just a fantastic conversation. So if you're on the edge of thinking about or really close to the finish line of saying, hey, it's time for me to sit up straight and pay attention, listen and think about what I want to do with my business, uh, this would be a great podcast for you. So I'm very excited and let's go. You know, I think the way I would describe our conversation today is if you're on the edge, on the verge of, of, of selling your business uh, or really thinking about it, this is probably a great conversation. But I think there's a lot of people that benefit from, you know, if they're further out, maybe not like within a year or two, maybe they're still five years away. Maybe we can talk about how, how they can position themselves. But before we get into like the nitty gritty, just let's just go around the room real quick and then give your 15 second introduction of yourself and what you do. Scott, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Scott Stone from Stonehouse Investment Management. We help people with financial planning and in this case, pertinent to this podcast episode, we help business owners plan for their future retirement uh, needs and help them manage money that might come as the, um, as the effect of selling their business and help them manage that money over time so that they have income for the rest of their lives. Great. Bob? Hi, I'm uh, Bob McCormick. I'm managing partner at Murphy McCormick Capital Advisors. We're a regional investment bank covering the mid-Atlantic states. Uh, primarily, we help buyers and sellers in the, the buying businesses and selling businesses. Uh, we do a lot of business valuations, probably about 20 to 40 a month. And uh, we also help with corporate turnarounds and arrange financing as well, too. Uh, a team of about 12 people. And we're also founders of the Cornerstone International Alliance, which is a um, multi-state and multi-country uh, M&A group. Hmm. We could probably talk for a good hour just to what you guys do. But. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Paul, what about you? Uh, Paul Rushton, uh, managing partner of Rosen Jenkins and Greenwald. We're a full-service law firm, and uh, we focus – our business and finance department focuses on full service for corporate clients, but we do a lot of buying and selling of uh, businesses. I'm Ben Denault. I'm the managing partner, Stonehouse Tax Business Municipal Accounting. I'm a CPA. We deal in, uh, in income taxes, corporate, personal – um, as well as planning, estate planning, and uh, bookkeeping, payrolls, the, the full service. Awesome. So let's start here. Let's start big picture, and then we'll zoom in. I think there's a lot of places that we can zoom in. But one of the things, and I'll ask you guys, the reason we do planning for almost anything is to avoid the oh no's and the, and the pitfalls and the landmines. So what? Give me, give us some examples of things that you most commonly see that blow up a deal, like. Or, or the deal never even gets to the table. Like, what are things that people are making mistakes? I mean, anybody can jump in, but I, I, I would uh, say the the bigger things that blow up a deal is is again not having the planning. So, um, mm -hmm. and, and and it's good Ben's here because the tax issues often are a big issue. They don't recognize what the net proceeds are going to be, so they think they're going to get fifty million dollars in net proceeds. In reality, they're getting twelve because of taxes, debt, and fees, and all those type of things. Um, and typically, there's a valuation gap that goes with it, or there's there's customer concentration issues that come in, into play. Um, they don't think about how to transfer the uh, the, the co contracts. I mean, Paul and I, you, Paul and I were talking about that earlier today. Some vendor and, and customer contracts require certain um, 
activities to make those transfers happen. If they're not planned out well, um, it could really blow up a blow up a deal. That's just a few. Maybe in the parking lot, I was talking to somebody about family matters. There's uh, mm -hmm. ownership issues that are not resolved, or just the whole family dynamics. I mean, family dynamics is probably the one that, that we see a lot of, regretfully, in family-owned businesses. Yeah, that's yeah. actually Bob. Why I, I was so excited about today to get all all you guys in the room because for someone to really take it from the start to the finish line. Pretty much most of that's covered by who's in the room in this conversation today. So, Paul, what about you? Do you have anything more to add to what yeah, Bob said? Yeah, well, so I think one of the big things that we talk to clients about is when someone comes and looks at you to buy you, it's partially a confidence game, right? So they come in and they look at you, and the more that you have everything under control – and everything spelled out and everything ready for them to take a look at. Bob and his team set up a great data room when these things happen with all the documentation they're looking for. The more that you go down the road and you don't have your act together, you don't have the documents, you can't find the documents, you don't know exactly what approvals you need and everything else, it makes the buyer wonder whether you're a well-organized company that they should buy. Mm. Because the biggest thing we talk to clients about all the time, and this is an analogy we use that I think really resonates with people, when someone's buying a business, it's a lot like when they're buying a car. They're expecting it to have certain features, right? Like like air conditioning, this, that, the other thing. And they're expecting it not to have problems like a lemon law. There's liens against it and everything else. So what they're looking for as part of due diligence is they're really trying to make sure they can check the boxes like, okay, it doesn't have any of these problems that we're not looking for. And it has certain of these features that we're looking for. One big one Bob and I were talking to a client about today is, do you have sufficient networking capital so that when we take this company over, we're not going to be underwater and right. cash strapped? And so what I talk to people a lot about in in getting ready for a business, we I wrote an article one time called Utilizing the Calm Before the Storm. And the calm is the the storm is really the due diligence process, the selling process. It's super stressful. But if you start before then and really get yourself all these steps together, you can be ready once Bob and his team present you with a really great offer you're ready to follow it through and get the deal done. Yeah. And so what I've seen most often where a deal goes sideways is two things. Number one is all those things don't get answered in a way that makes the buyer comfortable and sometimes they walk away. Or it takes so long that the deal loses its momentum and then sometimes it just falls apart for that. I'm sure you've seen that a bunch, Bob. We have that going on with a deal right now. It's just, it's taken too long to get done everybody's cranky with each other. It's just, it's a bad scene and I don't know if it gets done. So preparing in advance so that you have your, for lack of a better term, your ducks in a row, that is really kind of what I think is the best chance to make sure that your deal goes through and goes through without having issues. Right. Yeah. I would imagine it sets a tone right off the bat, right? So if they ask you for these five forms and you're, I don't know what three of those forms are, right. that's probably heading in the wrong direction. So. Any more add, add to that, Ben? And the only thing I would I would add that I've I've seen quite a bit is is waiting until the year you want to retire right. to try to start selling your business. Yeah. Right, I, I see that constantly. Um, if that's on your five to ten year horizon, you need to get started. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, I I see pretty frequently that well, I don't have any real intentions to retire. Well, then you know, mid seventies show yeah. up and you don't have a succession plan. Well, now it's it's late. Sure. Right. It's late. So don't don't wait too long to get ben, started. Ben, there's a national stat out there. Eighty percent of businesses do not have a succession plan. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, at, and we were with our um, European and Canadian affiliates this past weekend and some uh, affiliate from Brazil. And it's the same across the world, too. It's yep. just amazing that people don't plan. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But but in their defense. They were planning on something different happening, mostly like for family-owned businesses. Hmm, yeah. The plan was for the next generation Kids to take know. over, and then sort of generational things happen, and people were like, you know, I don't want this business. Right. You know, I want to go do X, Y, and Z. And so then it was like you got to recalibrate everything and figure out, okay, if that's not going to happen, what do we do? Because we knew a ton of businesses that were like, I always just thought my son was going to take this thing over, mm -hmm. and then he tells me I'd rather, you know, do anything else but doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, you know, it's awful. So it, it, they definitely, there's not enough planning going on, but the planning's harder because there's not as many yeah. solid succession plans as what people had had in the past. Yeah, and well, and, and Paul, even transferring to family or employees, 
you still need the plan. Right. Because there's the liquidity event that they probably need to live on. And right. that's where the, the wealth management advisors really can come into play here is helping mm-hmm. that plan, that, you know, because you 90% of the liquidity is in that business too. Right. So if they're going to transfer it to the kids and have to figure out how that liquid liquidity event's going to happen, they're going to be financing that for a long period of time. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And to, you know, to add to that bit a little bit, if, if it's going to the kids, a lot of times it's going at a discount, right? And that discount's a gift. That gift still requires evaluation. So whether it's going for sale or whether it's going to, to children or whatever, I remind people, still get the process started well before you want to actually complete the transaction, no matter who it's to. Yeah. And on that point, the one thing that I think is really helpful to understand about planning for your business you know, to be sold, a lot of the things that you should be doing to plan to sell your business are the same things you should be doing for your business Running anyway, business. right? Yeah. So, very true. I mean, like, you know, for the idea of like, you'd like to know, you know, like you have all your ducks in a row for this new business to see. Well, you should really have those in a row for your own business as and it the, operates the because, that, you know, anyway. one thing Bob and I have been talking a lot about, that data room that he sets up for clients when they get there. We've been we've been suggesting to clients that they just have a data room set up for themselves for the operation of their business in advance mm-hmm. so that, you know, for contract administration and all the other things that might come up or they share it with you guys because you need to know something or they share it with their tax advisors. Mm-hmm. Having those documents in place and organized and updated and everything else it saves so much time later, and then it also helps with the from the standpoint of when 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 you're trying to operate your business, you know right where everything is. Mm-hmm. I told a story to Bob earlier. We're meeting earlier, and this is a good story at this point because it really helps. We had had a client that was in a uh, they had a buyer that was doing a series of deals, long series of deals, and they were like third in line. And they had their stuff together so much that they got bumped ahead Mm because it was taking too long to get the other deals done. And then ultimately, you never know when the buyer's going to stop buying. And so our client ended up being like the last one that they bought before they decided they were going to end it. And I always thought about that. I tell clients that story all the time because his organization was really what allowed him to become you know, a better target, uh, an easier acquisition for this company. And so you want to do whatever you can to make yourself as easy of an acquisition as possible from a from a cost perspective and anything else because you're just way more attractive. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really just being empathetic, right? If yeah. you're trying to make yourself look pretty for a sale, just think if you were the one buying, right. what would you want to buy? Mm-hmm. Um there's so many directions that I like. I'm so excited that we're having this conversation. <laughs> <No. laughs> um, so let's talk about so to Ben's the end of Ben's point there about planning, right? When is it a good time to start planning? I guess it's really going to depend on the industry, the type of business you have. Bob, you're shaking your head already. You got yeah. I, 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 we like to see people plan three to five years or more in advance. Okay. And I think it leads to some valuation thoughts that, that you had as well here. But we like to do that valuation five years in advance, um, looking at it from a net proceeds perspective too then. What's it what's it look like after taxes and fees? And that's the only thing you could spend because, you, you know, let's, quite frankly, you got a 30% or 40% partner in your businesses. So it's really critical that that planning – Takes place, and one one of the ones that frustrates me the most is when we we see somebody that has a, a real true growth curve, and they could have done some gifting or estate planning at a lower valuation, five, six, seven years ago, and then suddenly, you know, they're worth nothing, and suddenly they're worth a hundred million dollars, right. and then they get an LOI and say, well, let, can I go back and <laughs> gift it at zero or gift it at ten thousand, ten million or whatever? Yep. You can't do that now, so. Um, we like doing the we like doing the planning well in advance. Some of the things that Paul touched on of of um, issues that come out in due diligence, you can many of those could be addressed. Customer concentration issues, depth of leadership, um, financial reporting is a big issue that we mm-hmm. see. Uh, getting the financials up um, improved, all those type of things take some time. You know, whether you're a C corp, you have the double taxation issue in a sale. You know, if you if you wait a year of the sale to deal with the C-Corp double taxation issue, your choices become a lot more limited. But if you deal with it seven years ago, there's that five-year window goes away eventually, the built-in gain tax. So we prefer well in advance. And our best clients over the years have been ones that have done three to five or six, seven years in advance planning. 
Yeah, Ben, just before we were rolling, you were talking about the yeah, S Corp, C Corp. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the built-in gains tax because five years is kind of my target window because mm -hmm. I see a lot that get to retirement and they start at three and that's fine. They're a C Corp, right? They want to elect to BS so they can pull their equity out without having to pay tax on the dividend again. Well, built-in gains, right? The property that you had on the day you made the election, if you sell that within five years, you're still going to pay that tax on it like mm -hmm. a C-Corp. So um, five years, you make that election, change your status, mm -hmm. and things get a little nicer for you. So, yeah. and, and Robert, it does get to why the planning is so important. There's ways around that building gain tax, things like personal goodwill. But if you have an employment contract, it disqualifies you from personal goodwill. So that's where like Paul would come into play to make sure the contracts are mm -hmm. are in place. And um, and that does take planning to, to get me or anybody else to do evaluation on personal goodwill too. So, you know, the, the, the planning that Ben just referred to really is critical. Yeah, I, I would say, yeah, maybe I'm being presumptive here, but uh, I'm, I'm being self-serving because I'm, I'm trying to suggest where they do the financial planning, right? So you get so busy running your business and you're so excited that it's finally working or it's just starting to take off. And you think, I just got to do more hours. But if you don't take that little bit of time to do a little planning, right, then you, you sit with a financial planner who says, you know, hey, what's your end goal? What are we shooting for? You really have no idea what you're shooting for. You're just plugging in more hours. Mm -hmm. You're probably jeopardizing your personal relationships at home and with your friends. And next thing you know, your life has become the job instead of uh, working on the business. And, and back the business. to the what, what Scott does and what you do, after I do that valuation, I want to do net proceeds. I like them to take it to both of you. Mm -hmm. And and most business owners, you know, most people are living to 90 now. So they think their lifestyle is going to change post-closing. They're not going to travel God, as much. So, That's not the case. <laughs> so you really need a liquidity event that supports you to live to 90 the way you sure. want to live. Correct. Along with the other nursing home expenses, things along those lines. That's not going to determine the business valuation. But it does determine things that how do we get there from a planning perspective. Yeah. On the business side, you get there on the, on the personal side. Yeah, the, the first part, is before you start marketing your business is trying to determine, can I afford to retire? Can I sell my business? Can I exit? What does that mean? Am I going to parlay that into a different type of career? Am I going to work somewhere else? Am I going to start a new business with some of the proceeds? And um, so I think you have to start from the emotional aspects of why am I selling the business? Is it the right time to sell the business? Who am I selling the business to? And then once you get to that part, you can uh, move forward. But one of the interesting things, uh, an actual client, um, uh, example that I worked with with Bob actually was um, almost an incidental entrepreneur uh, who just kind of started a side hustle in addition to their primary uh, uh, work and built a very a nice reasonably large local mom and pop business but they had been running it uh, with the primary goal of maximizing the amount that came into their pockets and when you do that the the accounting gets a little weird and so coming back to that kind of five-year time range uh, when Bob came in and, and looked at some of the uh, financials they didn't look good and it was not ready to be marketed and so it took a good three to five years for those uh, different uh, issues within those mm -hmm. financial statements to be worked through before it could get to the point where you could bring it to market. And so um, there's a lot of different aspects in there that you have to consider and starting planning early is uh, very important. Yeah, I mean, you know, the one other thing that sort of, I agree with all the time frames everybody talked about, but as we go through, especially now that things have changed so much, like I, I tell Bob sometimes, we used to, we do buying and selling, and it used to be about equal. Every 10 deals we'd have, we'd probably buy five, we'd, we'd sell five. Lately, it's been more like eight to two or so, nine to one selling. And and so whenever we, from the moment we start representing a client, even if it's at the formation stage, we're already talking about preparing yourself to sell. Because as you go along, you'll make lots of decisions. And as you do it, all of it should be with at least a mind that you may sell. So I'll give you, for instance, um, you talk about gifting, talked about gifting. There's a lot of good things that could happen from gifting. But as we gift to the next generation, one big thing we have in mind is, yes, but if we ever want to sell, you're going to sell right along with us, a drag along. So, 
you know, a lot of times people bring on their kids, they didn't think anything of that. Now we want to be in a position, especially since a lot of times these deals are not always asset deals. We'll talk about structure later. They're not always asset deals. They're more and more stock deals, especially in connection with an EFRI organization. So what we're talking to clients about up front is, listen, you may need to have that, you know, your children that you're gifting to agree to sell later and they might have to sell their stock. So it's not like 51% of the shares are going to be able to authorize an asset deal like you normally do. You might need to get everybody involved. Now, Mm -hmm. there's some ways around it, but especially private equity likes it much better if it's wired up front Mm -hmm. that you can make it happen. So when we do the shareholders agreement with them, when they're doing the gifting, we have a provision that says if the majority of shareholders want to sell, regardless of the form of transaction and regardless of if it's a F reorganization or anything else, those children have to go along with it. Mm-hmm. And so it's pre-wired. So when you're gifting and everybody's happy, I've got to ruin it by bringing up this drag along, <laughs> okay. which has yeah. a very unfortunate name, but that's planning to sell. Mm-hmm. And that's making it work better so that as they're going through their due diligence and everything, a private equity firm doesn't have to worry like, oh, one of these shareholders may not want to do it. Mm-hmm. And the one thing that, you know, you want the comfort of that going into it because sometimes – um, you may not want to tell everybody about the deal way in, way ahead of time. Right. You might want to tell them later in the day where everybody spent a lot of time with the whole thing and having the comfort of having that provision in place. So it's just an example of how, you know, yes, three to five years, all that stuff, but almost always as you're planning and you're making steps, keep it in mind where you might want to go with the sale of the business. Mm-hmm. Yeah, my mind's racing in a bunch of different directions here and I – might be a little too early. I was going to talk private equity versus strategic buyers and things like that. But before we get into that, um, on the accounting side, mm-hmm. like so getting all your ducks in a row, you know, I think so it's the financial planner. Scott, would you say the financial planner's role is to s- start big and say, what are you trying to do? Yeah, I kind of see a financial planning role is kind of bookend. So you start at the beginning and say, where is your life now? What are you trying to accomplish? What do you want to happen from this point forward? And then if that leads to sale of the business, then you engage the rest of the team here. Right. And then at the end, the business is sold and there's a, you know some sort of payout uh, and you have to make that last for potentially the rest of that person's life. And so financial advisors are kind of at the book ends of the process, I think. Yep. Back You're to hit, um, Scott's point, one of the ideal ways to plan well in advance is – we really want our customers to be able to have all five strategic options, sell to the family, do a management buyout, mm-hmm. potentially do an ESOP, do a private equity type transaction or a strategic. And if you do the well for strategic or private equity, you can handle the, the other one. You know, ESOPs, there's other disqualifying factors. But if they could plan when, when they're dealing with Scott, on the personal planning piece, along with the business plan, if they can have that in the, on their mind, mm-hmm. there's no guarantee their kids are going to buy the business. Yeah, right, true. But or there's no guarantee their employees want to buy it. But at least have a a plan that they're they're marketable, as Paul said, marketable to all the different buyer universes out there, and to the financial institutions that are going to lend to them too. Yeah. yeah, I think that's where I'm going with right. Ultimately, just getting or back to organization. Be, be as organized as you can, resourcing, outsourcing where you need to, right? Yeah. And I think, Ben, we see a lot, I know you do on the accounting side, where people, hey, they were a one-man band. They started out and sure. they did their own books or they and their spouse. And now all of a sudden there's 20 people and their payroll is overwhelming and they're working in their business constantly but not on the business, right? And yeah. adding a CPA or adding some good accounting back backstopping what you're doing can be very valuable, right? Yeah. They, you know, again, I'm, I'm biased, but I think you should you have that biased. all the it's time. Okay. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you know, we're cycling back to that, the buyer's comfort zone mm-hmm. here, right? I mean, if they get in and they start this process and your, your bank reconciliations like aren't right, if we get like <laughs> that basic to where the accounting, the general ledger work is not up to snuff, uh, then they're not going to have a comfort zone that the financials they're looking at are even usable. And what are they buying? You know, that, that that kills deals before they start if they get in and the financials aren't quality financials. Uh, and it's an easy thing to fix, right? It's it's Accounting isn't rocket science, I, <laughs> and I will say. But, you know, to, to just get the financial data right, um, you should always be doing that. But especially if, you're, if your goal is to sell, 
um, to get everything as as neat and tidy as you can. Well, and, and Ben, you've probably seen this, but one of the almost every size deal we're seeing now is getting a quality of earnings audit done. Mm -hmm. And that is pretty comprehensive yeah. to the um, the business owner. If they're not prepared, it could be a real challenge. And back to the tax planning part of that too, is we still see a lot of cash basis financial statements or yeah. tax mm -hmm. returns that really should be on accrual. And then that tax impact, you get a C Corp with cash basis and it's really should, and you get the accrual impact to it well, for the buyer boy, the tax bill is just, mm -hmm. um, they're just kicking a can down the road anyways in taxes. Yeah. When you get to a certain size, you know, accrual makes, accrual makes sense uh, for you. And yeah, I mean, anytime you start the sale, you're going to have to go back several years yeah. and recast those statements on an accrual basis. Is it doable? Yeah, we do it all the time. But does it take time, slow the deal, and maybe make your buyer go it find does. someone else? Sure. Yeah, and in the form of financial statement, right? I mean, if mm -hmm. you know, sometimes we have people say, "I'm on, I'm on the income tax basis of accounting," and and that doesn't go over very well. You know, I mean, yeah. everybody's looking to have some measure of account involvement in it, and whether it's reviewed or you know, or compiled or, but preferably audited. Right. And in that three to five year window, I see a lot of people start getting people involved in getting real financials for their last three years. I don't know how much you counsel we're, people. To yeah, do we're that, we're but. seeing a lot of that. We're we're seeing the the kind of the bridge between income tax basis to accrual going back three to five years too yeah. being done. And and we're seeing a lot more pre-market quality of earnings, meaning we go to get the quality of earnings done now, then we go to market. The the buyer's still going to do a quality of earnings, but it goes much quicker then. Yeah. Yeah. And that's um the same concept that, that Bob's talking about there is something we do a lot on the legal side too. We call it an internal audit, but it's really basically you going through Doing the things that a buyer would do and then seeing the problems and fixing them in advance. It's the same way the quality earnings do it. So, for instance, we'll look and maybe the ownership isn't right, like we talked about beforehand. That is a frequent one. It is not it, it is not lined up right. You know exactly what, what's lined up. The other things we talk to people about is as they're renewing contracts, at point Bob made earlier, we're negotiating into them that we have the ability to assign them you know, or at least assign them with with someone's consent that can't be unreasonably withheld. You most times, especially with your form contract, we've had a business sending something out that said the other side had a consent to it before they could assign it, and we said, did did they did the did your customers is. Uh, insist upon that or you just have it in there they go I got it off the internet and I said if we could write it the exact same way and say that either be silent because then you could assign it or have in there that in that event you can assign it you know without their consent people don't even read it through but then when we have to get ready to do the deal we don't have to go get 12 consents which slows down the deal and everything else so mm -hmm. it's all little things like that that you could fix if you just look at it in advance and you fix your accounting side, you fix your legal side, and then you're better ready to do the deal. I have a quick question if I could just interject, and maybe this is where you're going, Bob. But when you're talking about all those things, the way you just ended that sentence, you've got the, the wealth management, the taxes, the valuation, the legal issues. How important is it that you all play well together? <laughs> uh, and, and can that blow up a deal? Have you seen that? Oh, yeah. Paul and I just talked about that okay. uh, uh, about a month ago. It, it, my view is you get a deal team uh, and your your attorney may not be your personal attorney that you've been using for 30 years in the business. You want to bring in a, a, a m and attorney that has experience doing m and a. You're going to say you're going to think you're spending more money by doing that, but you're probably going to save money because it's going to cut down on wasted time. And it, I always prefer to have an m and a attorney that has a strong tax background. And also a strong estate and gift background too within the firm too, and they they can align things real well together, and a good CPA firm goes a long way. Um, I mean, there's there's times we almost want to disqualify even starting working with a client when we see certain accounting. Sometimes they're not CPAs or they're there's a handful of public accountants still left in the state, and there's there's registered agents that uh, really are not skilled with this, but a, but I. Uh, when you get to the wealth management side of things, you get somebody that doesn't understand, you know, a lot of Paul's probably will talk about this. We're seeing a lot of rollover equity right now in transactions. Well, we, we value it one way, that rollover equity. Many cases, the private equity firm's okay with them gifting those shares 
to a trust or a state or things along those lines. But you need a wealth management firm that's familiar with that on how to do that. If you get a – You want to explain what rollover equity is? I don't know if most people watching this would know. Okay. So rollover equity is you sell your business, say, for $10 million, and the buyer comes back and says, we love you to reinvest back in the business. And we'd like you to roll 20% of the, the – and that may be $2 million. We'll just use that to keep it simple. It was an all-cash equity, all equity deal. Um, there's ways to do that from a tax perspective, which minimizes your taxes at closing. But then you got $2 million in equity in this privately held business. What do you want to do with it? And you're hoping it grows. You know, PE wants to grow four times. You're hoping it grows to $8 million in value. It's a good time to put it in. And we don't do estate or gift planning. It's a good time to talk to Scott. And let Scott find a place to put it. Right. <laughs> and uh, and at some point, there's going to be a liquidity event that comes with that too. But planning that well in advance, it, if we're all aligned, and you're going to want Paul as an attorney agreeing with that rollover equity and that shareholder agreement, does it make sense what we're doing? Everybody needs to be aligned to those things. If you mm -hmm. get one, we had a deal recently just took forever to close because this, the sell side attorney wasn't computer illiterate, but also struggled with m and I haven't done a real good size M&A deal in years. So just cross off the reps and warranties. Just cross off the reps and warranties. <laughs> send it back to Paul. And Paul wasn't the attorney on the other side. You know, if you're a New York attorney, you get that back. You're going to say, I'm wasting my time on this thing. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to charge my client fees, but sooner or later that private equity buyer in particular is going to say, we're wasting our time. This is never going to close with that attorney involved. Yeah, I was, I was literally just going to say that. So I think the biggest thing that a qualified team can do is two things. Number one is before the deal, you know, you got to convince a client that this is the right thing to do. And if everybody's of one voice, now everybody should disagree if they don't agree, but if everybody's done this enough and they know it's the right thing to do, the client usually goes along with it. But it's hard, right? I mean, a lot of the things we're talking about, doing a quality of earnings, you know, having a legal audit done, it all costs money sure. and time. Things that, you know, a lot of people as they're running a business in their business, they don't have the time and sometimes they don't think they have the money, even though it's going to save them money in the long run. But if you have a dissenting voice for someone who doesn't really do this all the time, I feel like it's the one voice that the client says, see, I don't have to do this. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And yeah. and that's big. And so having a, a team that obviously you should disagree if you think it's wrong, but who does it all the time, it's more likely the client's going to get good advice. The second thing that comes in on that is once you go through the deal, one thing that we talk about all the time and Bob and I will talk about a lot is what's quote unquote market for a deal. So reps and warranties, you're good, you're, they're in every deal. And if you do these all the time, you know which ones are fair. You know, there's usually a range of negotiation on any issue. And whoever has more leverage, you know, if we have very limited leverage, the reps are going to be stronger. If we have better leverage, they're going to be a little weaker. But it should all be within a certain range. If you know that market and your broker knows that market and your accountant knows that market, you can talk clients out of trying to negotiate things that they're mm -hmm. never going to get mm -hmm. ever in a million mm -hmm. years. And it makes you look bad to the other side and it wastes everybody's time and money. And sometimes it prevents a deal from getting done. But clients don't know. I mean, they, unless they've mm -hmm. sold a business previously, it's like they just sent us a 45-page 45 45 document. I can't make heads or tails of it. They need advisors who could say, listen, I do this all the time. Bob and I do this all the time. Ben does this all the time. And and we see these all the time. This is what it looks like. Here's the range of negotiation. Let's figure it out. If everybody's on the same page, it's great. All of a sudden, one advisor is like, we shouldn't have to do any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. It's a big <laughs> step back. Yeah, so for right. me, that's a big deal, really big mm -hmm. deal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would have to say just experience. I mean, when – People love to come to us when they're about to retire because they know that we've dealt with hundreds and hundreds of people moving into retirement. Same with what you just said. With you know, for us, it's managing the wealth. But what you're talking about is a, is kind of a specialty, to be quite honest with you. Um, which actually brings me to another question I wanted to ask you. So my my problem is I I, I listen to uh, the audio book uh, uh, Built to Sell. I really love that book mm -hmm. and uh, it brought up some interesting points. One of the things they talk about in that and we've talked about with clients is is narrowing your focus. So people that have a good business, but it could be a great business if they focused on what they're really good at instead of trying to do everything. How much do you get involved in your roles in trying to help 
let, let's say it starts mm. with a conversation, Scott, like that you're, you're working with the client, the business owner, and they say, I, I can't do this much longer than five years. Yeah. And you start thinking about how much they could extract from that. How much do you get involved in your roles of saying, hey, look, this would be much more sellable if you didn't do all these things, if you just did this or these two really good things? Yeah, that's, that's I, hard. I, to... I think that starts with the, uh, the business valuation in many ways. The business valuation? The, you do the business valuation. Mm -hmm. Okay. We like to identify company-specific risk when we do that. So you know, we don't need to get into the micro-detailed business valuations, but – we're going to come up with six or seven things that impact the value. And some of those are within the owner's control, like the financial reporting, customer concentrations. But, yeah, the focus sometimes comes into play, too, as you just were alluding to. Um, and if we can identify that, we're going, to, we're going to speak to it. We hopefully are doing the business valuation as an update every year, too, so we can see if things change. It's really disappointing when they don't change. Uh, and a lot of times we're sending those customers back to a business coach too. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, might send it to a Vistage coach or an EOS coach or things along those lines. The owner of Built to Sell, John Warlow, talks about, you know, getting coaches involved at times or, or firms helping them coach it. So we don't particularly do it ourselves, but we'll identify those risks and suggest to making those changes. But it's, it's again, it gets back to that planning piece. If there's, yeah. we saw it with up here with the gas field world, you know, you, sure. you're, you're driving a dump truck and suddenly you're, you're having 30 water trucks. <laughs> you still have your dump truck business. You have an excavating business. You still have a dairy farm. Mm -hmm. What are you focused on? Yeah. And, um, and you're all under one corporation still filing a schedule C, um, you know, they've got the whole liability risks that, that Paul would probably deal with here too. But <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah, getting back to focus is really a challenge sometimes. Yeah. yeah bringing in a coach, as you, as you mentioned. So there's, you can, there's certain things that apply to most, if not all businesses, as far as hiring practices, marketing, um, things like that, that you can kind of generally coach, but I'm not a master of every single business that's out there. And so hiring the right coach for the industry that that person is in that has mm. a very niche familiarity with what they're doing, I think um, probably is one of the people missing from this uh, conversation is somebody specific to that industry that can help them fine tune their business model to say you should focus on this and not on this. Because it's hard if you're not in that industry to, to determine whether it you should maybe add water trucks, but maybe it's a bad time to add water trucks. And so it's um, hard to know unless you have all that information. Does anybody ever come back and when you gave them really sage advice and they make, they listen to it and they change and their business starts rocking, do they ever come back and say, Hey man, thanks for that awesome <laughs> advice. <Here's a> check. <laughs> no, I, I, I do. I think most clients Good. are like that. Sure. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny. It's not always getting smaller. It's like Bob and I were having a conversation earlier with a client about, how to potentially have a lesser concentration so that they didn't have one or two customers. So sometimes mm. it's, right. yeah. you know, it depends on what's going to sell the business. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? And the way we end up having it half the time is a client will keep coming to us and they're trying to collect money from a certain category of customer they have. And I just say to them after a while, it's like, I greatly appreciate all this work, but you're losing your shirt on this type of thing. Like, right. Why are you bothering with it? You talk to me, you know, about how much other work you have in the other field where you're not running into these problems. Like mm -hmm. it's it's intuitive, but sometimes they're not thinking about it because they're right in the middle of it. And you could take a step back and you say, why don't you just skip this part? This is always giving you headaches. Just don't do the work anymore. And they mm -hmm. go, yeah, that would that would be great. And so sometimes it's as simple as that. Or like what Bob and I were talking about, changing your concentration. So sometimes it's things you'll see as part of the internal audit that you say you can do better or you're always getting sued on this or you've got these collections that are so old on this one type of business and you just sh you should stop doing the business or at least stop working with those customers. Mm -hmm. But you know, but that's the kind of stuff that can really help later. And sometimes it really helps your bottom line. Yeah. And Bob mentioned that, you know, having, having water trucks in your excavating business, right? I mean, I, we see that with small town business, small business a lot, that there's a lot of really unrelated activities all just jammed in under one shell. Um, so I love segregation. You know, I, I, I'm telling clients all the time, you have wholly unrelated activities shoved under a, a related entity, right? So let's get these, let's get these out, right? Let's, let's have an excavating business and a water truck business, see if one can stand on its own two feet first and then go from there. Right. And then 
if it does well, great. If it doesn't stand on its own two feet, it's time to move on. And then you have the, yeah. the other side doing well to sell, right? So some division might make sense as part of that planning process. If you have a business with a lot of things going on inside, and really look at it and say, is this two businesses that I'm forcing into one bank yeah. account, right? And, uh, and that's, that's pretty common. Well, and from a liability protection perspective, sure. that's huge because, you know, water trucks, you know, and your other business, whatever's in the entity is subject to the liability associated with what happens. So the more you segregate it, the better chance you have of you, you don't have all your chips in the middle of the table. Right. Something goes wrong with business one, it doesn't affect business two and everything else. We, I spent half my life talking to people about that because they <laughs> yeah. have everything over there. I, I yeah, I, I've heard you. I've heard you talk. <laughs> yeah, about it. yeah, yeah. But it's a big deal, and it also really helps. Sometimes you sell just a, one of your divisions, right? And sure. and it's easier to sell and everything else. And sometimes it's way more lucrative, and the rest of it doesn't drag it down for your exactly, sale. And yeah. Yeah. yeah, we we've seen some of the parts worth more than the collect the mm, whole, right? Yeah, Especially when there's good segment accounting that goes yeah. with that too. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. So let me. We've been talking a lot about folks who are still a ways away. But before we get into the like, okay, we're we see the finish line. What do we have to do? I, I have here's my little story here. My story was my wife got off the phone with my daughter the other day. Both my kids are in college, and she kind of got hung up the phone. Well, I don't. I guess you don't hang up the phone. <laughs> days, right? She pushed the button, and uh, she said she just had this depressed look. I was like, what's going on? She's like. I don't think our kids need us anymore. And I was like, <laughs> yeah. And I went out in the kitchen, I came back and I said, you know, this is exactly what we work so hard to do. And she's like, I know it's just, you know, it was bittersweet was the word she used. And, and I think I kind of view business the same way. Like, you know, it's not as, it shouldn't be as equal in my opinion as, uh, as your child, but it is kind of like this third thing, or in my case, I have two children, it's this third thing over here that I just put a lot of work and effort and a little bit of love into, right? And to be able to invite you guys, if I invite you guys and say, hey, I want to sell my business, one of the things that you're going to look for is to say, if this business, if it, if it depends on you, Bob, then it's not worth nearly as much or anything. It needs to be able to run without you. And so it's kind of that same thing. And making yourself so, replaceable. Yeah, replace yourself, all right? And so um, I see that all the time at work. I see people I work with all the time doing things that I used to do, and a lot of times they're doing it better. They're doing it different than I would have, and uh, I noticed that, but usually they're doing it better. And I think that's another step forward, right? So are, is there a time where you'll look at it? Have you looked at businesses that, that called you up and said, I'm interested in selling, and, and, and you've said, I can't really extract value or, or you say we've got a ton of work to do here. What do you do with something like that? We, we see that more often than not. Sure. And, and certainly when you look at private equity as a buyer, that's a big issue with them. Right. So one, it's a risk for the fa their own family anyway. So if they get beamed up tomorrow and that company's 80% dependent on <laughs> uh, Well, it's better to get hit by a gas yeah, truck. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but if, if they're no longer in the business, and it doesn't necessarily, you know, COVID should have taught us, people get disabled in businesses too, not just get beamed up. And you don't plan for disability typically. You plan, sometimes you do plan for that with life insurance and things along those lines. But many of our, many of our closely held businesses, even big ones, you know, um, uh, you know, $10 million EBITDA type companies don't have plans in place. And, and, they're still tied to that one key salesperson. That could be the owner. And so that that is a critical piece. And it does make them either unsellable or it makes them where that owner is going to have to stick around. And it does change the deal structure. Typically, when it's dependent upon one owner or a couple owners, they're going to be tied to an earnout or some structure that they're not going to get the liquidity event at closing. But it's going to be as they transfer that tribal knowledge in there. Um, customers and employees and vendors to that new new company. I mean, we um, Paul and I haven't had a chance to talk, but we have a mutual client that I was shocked there was no life insurance with that company. Mm -hmm. And its value has gone from probably near zero, not that far long ago. It's probably approaching $75 million, I think, in value. Mm -hmm. and, That's um, awesome. and it's nice, but there's a tax bill now. Sure. Uh, if that person got beamed up and it was valued at the full market, it wouldn't get – Full market value without the owner there, but it's an issue that needs to be yeah. addressed. Liquidity, but you got to pay the taxes, and there's no cash around to pay the. Taxes. There's, there's absolutely no cash. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's a Automatic. it's a it's a real challenge out there. But uh, um, more more often than not, that's the issue. Yeah. Again, that's where we we go back to maybe a business coach or somebody like that can often help in in, in advising them and trying to help them hire somebody. Uh, some of our best sales are when they brought in that next layer of management. Mm-hmm. And then um, the other thing we're doing a lot more, we're seeing a lot more incentive equity. Paul does this or phantom equity where you um, bring in that next layer of leadership, give them some sort of equity and a, and some sort of structure that they stick around. And um, and then you're building that future for the company. So that gives you the alternative to do a management buyout strategic or private equity buyer coming in, you know, they're getting key people and uh, there's ways to do that with minimizing taxes too, at least for the employee. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. It's um, sometimes a lot of what people are buying in some respects is your, is, is your people. And the more you can keep them around for how you're operating now, but also keep them so that they're tied to the business after the fact. Mm. Bob talked about an earnout just to sort of explain what an earnout is. An earnout is where a portion of the purchase price is not guaranteed, but is based on the performance of the business for a period of years, usually after the closing. And so if your people don't stick around and they're key people, that business might go really sideways and you'll never get that money. Earnouts are not something you ever ask for unless you think you're <laughs> undervalued and you're going for it. That you know, it's while someone else is operating the business and it's hard, but it happens a lot, and we see it a lot now. Um, and so, finding ways to keep people, especially you know, it's hard to keep people anyway. Mm-hmm. And so, some of the things we talk about, Bob mentioned Phantom Stock. What Phantom Stock is, it sounds scary, you know, like it's like from Halloween or something. But what it really <laughs> means is you're treated. It's a plan that sets you up as if you're treated like you have equity but you don't actually have equity. So in other words, is on the liquidation event, whatever it ends up being, or sometimes throughout the whole operation after you get the phantom stock, you're treated as if you had like, let's say a hundred shares in the company, even though you technically don't have a hundred shares and you're paid as if those shares were in effect, even though they're not. It's really a form of a, bo- it's a, it's a way to determine a bonus in mm-hmm. a way, but it's tied to stock and it makes everybody feel like they're more part of the business, but you don't have the headaches of, they actually have to consent to the deal and they don't have to like, they don't have rights to see the information of the company and everything else. So it's increasingly something that people are using phantom stock or similar types of things. And it keeps people in the mix. Sometimes it makes them stay until a sale because the liquidation event can be that sale. And so it's a way to keep people on. There's other similar ones we've done, like a retention bonus. I don't know if you've seen any employees have retention bonuses. Sometimes there's such a key employee that you want to keep them on. And sometimes it's a number of them. And then the other way, and if you read a lot of the management books, you'll see the best way to keep people as part of the business is to make them feel like they've got more and more ownership in it because they're making more and more decisions with it. And Mm -hmm. so bringing people on, actually letting them do things and everything else, it's more likely that they're going to say, boy, this is a gratifying, you know, position for me Mm -hmm. and it's something I like being in. So there's a lot to it, but uh, your people are a big part of your business, especially in service industry, but really I think Mm -hmm. in all businesses, at Mm -hmm. least as far as what we see. Robert, you asked to start this about what could blow up a deal. Sometimes that key employee piece mm. Is that right? can blow up a deal too. Especially, you know, Paul touched on retention bonuses. Those are great things to do, but don't wait till three days before closing and bring it up to the employee <laughs> sure. and say, you need to sign this non-compete and employment agreement with NUCO. And by the way, I want to give you $25,000 to do it. I mean, that's not enough to right. – you should be thinking about that well in advance, especially if that employee helped get you a big number too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Oh, sorry. We're just doing, a, there's a lot here. And I'm, I thought I knew a lot and I'm still learning more every time you guys talk. So <laughs> this is a good thing. Um, let's talk about, it's it's coming up to the finish. I can see the finish line. Okay. Let's say I, I and sometimes it's a health issue, right? Uh, as you mentioned uh, with disabilities or something, but, uh, and let's just assume regardless of the idea uh, of the reason you're saying I want to. I probably want to start looking at selling my business. You know, what is the first step? Is I need to get this thing valued, right? Is that the first step? I'm assuming they did some of the other things we've already talked about. Yeah. So the, typically, the first step that we do is we will value the business. We'll value it, then also looking at what's a typical deal structure. 
So there's there you know doing this for 19 years and and being active in the industry. There's You're finally no, starting to get good at it, Bob. Yeah, fine. <laughs> I hope. Uh, but the uh, most deals are not all cash deals either. As Paul alluded to, mm. things like earnouts, notes, roller of equity, all those things play into it. What's the net proceeds look like for you? And what's a typical deal structure? And what's the buyer universe look like for your industry right. or mm. your business? And then we typically want them to think that through. We also, uh, Scott touched on life post-closing. We want them to start thinking about not just that from a personal financial planning, but, you know, especially us males, we identify ourselves by our business. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're, if you're, uh, you know, XYZ in, the, in a small town at the country club, now suddenly you're yeah. not XYZ running that business anymore. But typically what we do is that first step, the valuation. And then we go back to somebody like Scott and say, Scott, is you know, this is what they think they're going to get from this. We're pretty confident this is a good number. Can you do some analysis? Does it make sense to do this? Mm -hmm. And likewise, we're also looking at the company specific risk things. We're also telling them to get to somebody like Paul right away too and their CPA. Uh, so we're trying to form that deal team right at that first stage. Whether they want to or not, they're subtly being urged to do that. So, you know, Paul touched on reading agreements. We had one a few years ago where my partner, Sandy, picked up reading agreement in that valuation stage. And it, the first right of refusal was with a vendor to buy the business. They never knew that. They signed his vendor agreement, never knew that XYZ Fortune 100 company had the first right to buy. They didn't really want to buy mm. the business. They just wanted to prevent it being sold to somebody, a competitor or somebody mm. that's going to screw up the vendor relationship. We got through that, but it's critical you get the whole deal team mm. involved right away. You know, one um, one key part of the deal team that we're not talking about, too, is internally, you know, everybody wants to keep it secret mm. because you don't <laughs> want it to get out and everything else. But you've got to trust one or two or three key people mm -hmm. internally because there's so much to do. What we always say about when you're doing a deal is you all, all of a sudden have taken on two jobs. You have your regular job, which, by the way, was giving you gray hair and keeping you up nights and everything else, of running your business. But now you have an almost equally sort of difficult job of trying to sell your business. And a lot of old business owners will try to do it themselves. That does not typically work well. Mm -hmm. And so you've got to trust one or two or three people internally, depending on the size of your business, maybe even more, that you're going to let in and know about the deal. And you've got to pick people you're going to trust to keep it quiet. But they're going to need to get for Bob and then for the owner. That data room that we're talking about yeah. is a ton of documentation information. Mm -hmm. The bigger the business, the more the information. And someone's got to really be in the position to not only get all that information at the beginning, but then update it as things change over time. Right. From the time that Bob starts talking to him about valuation to the time when they sell could be a year and a half, two years, yeah. you know, th that's, they, it could depend. And so like, as you're going along, you got to say like, oh, well, that's, we got rid of that contract. Mm -hmm. We got this contract, a really good controller right? Or really, like that's usually the person. There's somebody, usually someone on the ground that we just say, that is not only a key employee, they know where every single body's buried in this place <laughs> and they can get you whatever you need. Finding out who's that team's going to be. So all your outside advisors plus your sort of people that can get this deal done and keep their mouth shut in the interim. That's who you're really looking for. And that's a big part of that team. I don't know if you've had that experience. No, I, I, I agree. And that gets to be a challenge when there's only one one person trying to, especially the bigger company, you don't have just the financial uh, info streams. you got the legal, you got the vendor agreements, the customer agreements. HR is a huge one. Environmental is a huge one. Sales tax is a big one right, right. now. Uh, so having all those uh, due diligence info streams, having one person try to do it, it just slows the process up. Paul's firm and our firm have one where they think they're going to close within one week. I mean, do start due diligence and literally close within one week. And they are not prepared. We've been trying to get them prepared for as long as I can remember. But I, I, it's going to be – and it's all hands on deck at Paul's firm and our firm to help and others. But I, I don't see there's any chance it's going to happen. Yeah. And and I sent them a, a typical due diligence list that we typically – we don't even have the due diligence list yet. But a typical due diligence list that we – it's typically, you know, 15, 20 pages long with 500 items on it. Uh, it's tough to do that by yourself. Especially when you're, 
you know, as the business owner, it's you're it's, to run the it's not the stuff you're doing in your day to day either. You know, you, you're not filing your own sales tax reports. You're not doing mm. all that stuff. You're not filing this stuff away, right? I mean, it's to go get it when it's not your job to do it in the first place. Just because you're trying to be confidential, right. and you may have no idea where right. all that stuff is stored because that's not your job. As or or you said the business. wrong thing, right? right. I mean, right. that's that's typically, oh no, mm. like we replaced that three mm. months ago. Right. Mm. Um, I do see that, you know, especially with smaller companies, Ben, sometimes the guy in your role, you end up doing a lot of that work. Yeah. For, oh, I mean, I've yeah. seen that a lot yes. where like, yep. and, and we have a paralegal that she can find anything, I swear. And so <laughs> like sometimes your outside <laughs> advisors can suits. help with it, but sometimes an inside person you're going to need to. So. If you're going to have to lean on your outside advisors, you know, consider your timing too. You know, and your cost. I have, I have a couple of these every year where they start this process on the 20th of March. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and, you know, I apologize that you want to sell your business by April 15th, but I have 2000 tax returns to do <laughs> right. in the, the next four weeks. Right. I, I can't be running four or five copies of the last five years tax returns and building you accrual financial statements right now. Right. So if you're if you're of that size and you only have your one person that knows where everything is, well, you know, sell your business in June, right? Don't don't start this process and get the negotiations going and then make your buyer mad because you're not in a position to give them what they need. And yeah. Robert, how yeah. it affects the deal is either it doesn't close, there's bigger escrow accounts because of the, the risk issues, mm. or bigger earnouts or notes or things along those lines. And and um, and then Paul Paul preaches this. There's, there's schedules attached with stock purchase and asset purchase agreements and the get out of jail free card. If Paul can't put reliance on that information or there is no information, it makes it hard for him to argue reps and warranties and smaller buckets and baskets and all the good things that Paul argues on if we don't have good information. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, yeah. And and to Ben's point though, you know, this all carries back. All that stuff you do up front. That's why you do all that stuff up yep. front. Because mm-hmm. here's the funny thing about how this works. We're all talking about plan in advance, everything else. But sometimes an email just comes to you from <laughs> no one and it says, We're looking to pay you more money than you ever thought you were ever gonna yeah. get. And they say we want to do it in sixty days and you really want that money and you really try to get it done, but you're not really ready to get the deal done. And I've had that happen a bunch mm-hmm. of times, like especially with clients who came to us from somewhere else. They just didn't have it in mind. They weren't even thinking about selling. Mm-hmm. But you get the right number and it comes in. You want to make it happen. And so the more you do all this in advance and and when you're not stressed and, you know, you're not stressed like you're selling your business, there's really no stress like selling your business. I, Bob and I see and Ben see people do it all the time. It's a stressful time and you're trying to figure out everything else and you're making a major life change and, 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 and you're like, you know, that is not the time you want to be dotting all your I's and crossing all your T's. You want to dot them and cross them well in advance. <laughs> and so then you're not relying, you know, Ben, rightfully so, it's like right around tax time is going to be hard. Right around the end of the year is going to be hard for me and Bob because we've got so many deals going. So the more you're packaged and ready to sell, the more likely you're going to be able to sell in the window that that buyer wants you to. Bob, you just talked about an asset versus a stock purchase. And I know, Ben, you wanted to talk about that as well. Sure. Let's talk about what that is, what the differences are, pros and cons. You mind we dive into that? Yeah, and, and and Paul should uh, jump in here too. And there's hybrids of all those. No, Paul's talked enough already. Right uh, uh, <laughs> so right. so um, I'll speak from an industry perspective. Eighty-seven percent of all transactions across the U.S. are asset purchases. They're still buying the business. The form, from a legal and tax perspective, is they're buying basically the left hand side of the balance sheet, and they may be assuming liabilities as well. So. Um, Reason buyers do an asset sale versus a or asset purchase versus a stock purchase is for tax reasons. They can they can amortize goodwill in an asset sale. They can write up the fixed assets. Negative to a seller is depreciation recapture taxes. Often the taxes are higher than asset sale. A stock sale, you're buying the equity section of the balance sheet, your shares, and that's typically mostly goodwill. The hybrid is a thing called three thirty H H ten, which you do a stock purchase in an S-corp, and you treat it as an asset sale. Buyers do that for liability reasons. The other reason you do a asset sale versus stock sale is, is liability risk reasons. Paul can certainly touch on that. Um, 
We saw, though, and Paul touched on this earlier, we saw last year about 80% of our transactions were stock purchases. Mm -hmm. And we think there were a couple of reasons for that is quality deals were less in the market last year. So people were willing, especially private equity, more willing to do stock purchases. There's a thing called an F reorg. I'll let Paul talk about that as well. But that, in some ways, if done right, can minimize some risk for the buyer uh, out there. And and quality, qualif- pre-plan quality sellers that have their act together are more likely to get a stock purchase done too. And technically, you need a securities license to do a stock sale, just like you guys do with mm-hmm. your security licenses. We have a securities license to do a stock transaction as well. But um, back to that tax piece with the valuation piece, we'll do the analysis on a stock sale and an asset sale. But we typically show the asset sale in that analysis because we, we want to show them the risk of the net proceeds could be less with an asset sale. And how do we plan around that? And there's negotiations up and down that left-hand side of that balance sheet ways to minimize those taxes. And I might be taking some of your thunder, Ben, so sorry. No, no, that's fine. <laughs> that's, you do it all the time. So that that's just fine. But yeah, I mean, buyers like the asset sale. They shed liability. They get to write the assets off again, right? Um, sometimes I sellers get concerned about the increased tax liability. Well, you have to look at what your asset list entails to see if it really matters to you, Mm -hmm. right? I mean, your purchase price might be so far and above what your fixed asset listing has in it that the majority of what you're selling is goodwill Mm -hmm. and you're not worried about the recapture. Um, And when we're talking recapture, to kind of simplify that, if you've written off a pickup truck with ordinary depreciation and taking an ordinary expense for that truck and then you sell that truck you have to you have to pull that back in ordinary because you wrote it off as ordinary right where capital gains taxes is a little more favorable uh, so that's all the recaptures if you wrote it off you pay tax on it at a higher rate you never wrote off your goodwill and I'll let you mentioned if you employment contracts and non-compete agreements and stuff like that can preclude you from being able to do that, which is unfortunate, um, especially if you're the sole owner. I've seen it where people have non-competed them themselves hmm. <laughs> for no good reason, but they've, you know, they've, they've done it, you know, and, and it's there. And, and that was where they were trying to appeal to another partner or something along the way. I don't know. But um, if you're asset list is not that big and you're selling for a premium far and away above, you can likely do the asset sale and come out pretty similar for tax purposes. Uh, But the stock sale is better because it is always capital gains for you. Um, But like you said, there's negotiations up or down. If you're stuck with the asset sale, well, maybe you then go back to the seller and say, okay, I'm keeping my liability. You're getting all these write-offs. I want you to split the de- split the tax burden with me, right? Uh, or, or gross it up, right? So they'll yeah. say, uh, you know, gross up this purchase price so that I'm 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 a, I'm going to be treated the same way at the end of the day as if I did a stock deal, right? But you can do it on an asset basis because it'll help you from that perspective. Right. So we do a lot of talking about that. Uh, it ends up being a very stressful calculation of that gross up at the very <laughs> end of the deal, but, right? Uh, but that's the way it goes. Yeah, I mean, just to highlight a few things that these guys said. From a liability perspective, if you're a buyer and you're doing an asset deal, you'll say in the agreement, we're assuming only maybe none, but probably a very finite amount of uh, liabilities. Probably we'll assume some contracts. We'll assume any liabilities coming up after the closing that are first arising after the closing and don't relate to a breach of the agreement from before the closing. Other than that, it's probably it. Sometimes you you sometimes you'll assume some uh, accounts payable, mm-hmm. but other than that, that's usually it. And then, other than those assumed liabilities, you say everything else is an excluded liability, and we're not taking it. Now, the law doesn't exactly work like that. There's the possibility for successor mm-hmm. tax li- successor liability in a number of areas, such as tax. In Pennsylvania, we have something called the bulk sales laws, which means if you sell 51% or more of your assets to someone and you never pay your taxes to Pennsylvania or you never do your labor contributions to Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania says, well, you sold 51% or more of your assets, we can go after the buyer. Mm. And so there's possibilities for other other liabilities in an asset seal that we work very hard to protect against. But in a stock deal, you take all the liabilities subject to whatever you make somebody pay off, like debt-free, cash-free, all those sort of things. But generally, you take on all the liabilities. Um, the reason people like doing stock deals is they can be 
uh, from a logistical perspective, more more helpful. Like for instance, if you're in a business that has licenses and those are transferable, you know that doesn't change with a change of control. You don't lose them with a change of control. Or you have large contracts that would require an assignment, a consent to assignment, if you did an asset deal, but they don't have a change of control provision. Mm-hmm. Sometimes deals are literally done as a stock deal only because of one big contract. Hmm. that we don't think they would consent to and we want to keep, so we leave it as a stock deal. So that's generally um, why people do those liability-wise and why people do them logistically. Bob mentioned an F reorg. Yeah, I was going to ask Yeah, so what's what's been happening with with F reorgs? And candidly, I've asked around, and some of the reason I hear people want to do F reorgs versus 338H10s is because they're worried about defective S elections. And... They think that, you know, sometime away, you know, they're buying an S-Corp. <coughs> At some point it got blown and they don't want the risk of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, why all of a sudden that became in vogue? Because people have been doing this forever and that wasn't the deal. I don't know. I think it might stem from private equity. I don't know. But long short, here's what happens with an F reorg. Um, right before the sale or in advance of the sale, if you thought to do it, you basically set up a holding company. Okay. And so, you know, what happens with the holding company is everyone who owned the operating company ceases to own the operating company. They, instead, they exchange their shares for the same number of shares in a holding company, which then wholly owns, uh, wholly owns the operating company. And so then when you sell, you sell the stock of the holding company the hold, that the holding company owns in the operating company, and you sell that to the seller rather than selling the stock for directly from the shareholders and everything mm-hmm. else. Usually when you do that whole thing, you do, there's a, there's the, you know, that, that, that subsidiary, the operating company, then there's, there's things to make sure that they're both treated like S corp. So depending on the format and everything else, there's a Q sub election. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of times they'll convert the operating company from an S corp into an LLC. So it's a disregarded. I mean, there's all these mm-hmm. different things that happen, but long short is, um, as they do that whole process, it turns it, even though they're buying equity interest stock, it turns it from uh, a stock deal into an asset deal by tax, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And so if you want it to be still taxed like stock, then you have to say to them, we want it grossed up. Mm. But taking a step back and looking back at what we said earlier and preparing for it, those drag-alongs that I talked about that are in shareholders agreement or in operating agreements for a long time, for years and years and years, you'd almost see not see anybody do F reorgs, and it, it would happen once in a while. But they weren't normally set up for that. They were set up for if we do a stock deal, we could make you sell your stock too. They weren't set up for we could make you do this holding company, and then we can make you uh, you know agree to convert this like the whole process. And so that's then changed the way people draft their drag alongs because we want to make it so that. We can make everybody do it regardless of if it's a straight stock deal or an asset deal or this F reorganization. Any any of those instances, we want to make sure all those steps are pre-approved. And so it just made it for like a, a much more complicated. And then to Bob's earlier point, now with the rollover equity, we've also got to say that everyone will agree that part of the consideration for the deal can be equity. And so then you're going to you know be in a position where you're owning the equity after the fact, and you're pre-wired to be, have to be able to do that mm-hmm. and sign all these things you'll need to do in connection with that rollover equity. So it's gotten pretty complicated uh, in yeah. recent years. I, you know, and don't take this in, in the wrong tone, but when you just talk about what you just did, I'm reminded of the David Spade Phrase and Tommy Boy. <laughs> I'm going to retire with my fellow nerds to the nerdery. <laughs> right. I think this is the nerdery right here. Yeah. I'm in it too. I'm not, yeah. I'm not excluding myself. But I, to that point, though, I think that that is exactly why a business owner a business owner is really good at what he or she's doing, right? Or they are their team. They don't know this stuff. You guys are in it all the time, and so a lot of the you're speaking in a vernacular that they're not used to but they have to trust you. So um, the, the experience you have goes a long way. An, an example of why they should rely mm-hmm. on, back to the 330 H10 election, we had a transaction, and this goes back uh, in my banking days, where we had a client that, um, and I was at the like a dinner, because uh, we were gonna help finance the transaction. They were gonna do a stock purchase, and at 
the their M and A advisor and her attorney went out out of the both were out of the room were at the bar or something, and the comment was made: "Are you okay with this? We do a three thirty H ten election with this transaction." And the seller said yes, not realizing they just agreed to an asset sale tax treatment of the deal. Mm-hmm. And you know they got the horse back in the barn in that case, but you know it's it's you you really do need to have the advisors involved. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this. Yeah. One of you met Dave Weimer. Who used to work with me. Dave. Yeah, Dave always used to say it takes a village to sell a business, <laughs> and I agree 100 percent with Dave in that sense. That's an interesting phrase. You know, uh, Bob, real quick because it bears on that. One part of when you get your team together, though, is when you get your team together. So, what we see people do sometimes, the way this process sometimes starts, is with a either a term sheet or an LOI, letter of intent. And sometimes clients think because it's mostly non-binding, it just sets out the basic terms of the deal. Most, A lot of times clients will say, well, if this gets serious and we get to the part where we're doing the agreement, we'll bring in the lawyer, we'll bring in Bob, mm-hmm. we'll bring in everybody. The problem is that LOI includes some big things like, oh, say, we'll do a 33H10 election, or it'll be an asset deal, or it'll be a stock deal, or we'll do an F reorganization, all that stuff. But if you haven't talked to Ben and you haven't talked to me and you haven't talked to Bob, you don't really know what you're giving away. And you say, Mm -hmm. well, you know, it's non-binding. Well, they'll say to you, we went into this in good faith on the the, uh, assumption that this was the deal. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard to overcome that when you're trying to argue it later. Because sometimes when we're brought in later, we go, well, our client didn't really know. And they go, well, (laughs) you know. Well, the other other one, Paul's working capital has been a hot issue the last few years too. and. Trying to get the horse back in the barn after they negotiated working capital, what they didn't know what they negotiated. Yeah, yeah, right. And I would, you know, I'd add, you know, we've we've talked about, you know, Bob and yourself and I and having a, a, a team, right? You need to make sure your team is talking to each other. Yes, <laughs> right. Absolutely. I had, I had one of these a couple of years ago where where client's attorney was pretty much drawing a line in the sand over a three thirty eight, saying, "Don't do this. It makes it an asset sale for you," without calling the accountant to say, does that really matter? And, right. You know, and I, and I ran the whole projection of asset sale versus stock sale and we were within like 30 grand right. for income tax because it was all contracts. You know, it was a, it was a smaller business with a limited amount of equipment and fixtures and that kind of stuff. Not, you know, there, there wasn't real estate, there wasn't huge valued contracts that they purchased and amortized or anything like that. So the asset sale was fine with me. Right. And they were drawing a line in the sand because they didn't bother to call me. Right. Make sure your team is a team. <laughs> and, and Ben, bringing the, a good accountant in that understands us. Yeah. Even before you go to market, that you do the stock sale analysis and asset sale analysis mm-hmm. and assume valuation gives us the ability. What Paul talked about, truing that up too. Right. A lot of buyers are willing to true up that tax difference. Sure. If they can get mm-hmm. the 330 each time election. So it's a negotiation point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the one other part about getting your team together is I think clients sometimes think like, I'm going to have three, four people involved in this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to pay double or triple. If it's a good team, you divvy up what everybody does and they do it, you know, the people who could do it for the lowest cost and can do it best. I'll give you, for instance, Bob's team is really, really good at doing due diligence, really good at putting together that data room with some assistance from us, but really good at doing it and and at a much lesser cost. If people just have us do it, we're good at it too, but it costs more. I mean, it's just being mm-hmm. candid. And so, you know, or helping them come up with some things about, you know, we have tax folks, but Ben can do it more quickly. It's it's getting the team together and divvying up what everyone's going to do and trying to do it in the way that's going to help the, the the client the most. And they think maybe, oh, boy, I've got three people involved. I'm going to pay more. When I think the reality is they're going to pay less, it's going to take less time, and it's going to be done better. Can I ask you a question on that? So let's say I've worked 30 years building this thing to where I am, and I'm at that finish line, and I want to get this deal done, and I want it to work as well as possible, but I also want the most value I can extract for for myself on my exit. Am I wrong to think that it's less important about the this the, the certain fee differential between your firm and, and another firm? Or is it more important? Like, for me, I, I would think I'd want to, I want th- the people on my team that I can trust and I know that will work well with the others on the team. It might be a, th- a couple thousand more or a certain percentage, a little bit more or less. 
It's is it am I wrong to think that it's more about the trust in in your expertise? It, it, no, is it, it is. Do people shop purely on price? They shouldn't. They shouldn't. Right. I know that's going to be your answer. No, they shouldn't. <laughs> but but to be honest with you, there's a couple things I would say. Number one is um, you've got to have you got to find a home for your deal with people that are either your current advisors if they can do it, or are are vested enough in what you're doing that they're going to put like everything into it. Right. And sometimes we tell people like you shouldn't you shouldn't want to be the smallest deal somebody has because it might get backburnered more or it might get, you know, because they've got bigger deals that they're doing. Um, I can tell you this, when we do a deal and, you know, we, you, we've worked together, all of us, deals are, uh, deals are hard and they're going to ask a lot of the professionals to give up a lot of their time to work weekends, to work late at night, whatever it takes, to have conversations where they're talking clients off of, you know, off of like, oh my God, how am I going to get this done and everything else? And you got to have someone who's completely committed to the process. So however you judge that, I don't think it's really should be all cost. Mm -hmm. Now that said, you know, we're all talking about deals that are 30, 40 million. And so, you know, we've, we've, we do our fair share of those, but we'll also do deals where somebody has got to sell and they're not getting a ton Right. And they're, you know, it's a good deal. It's, it's fair market value for what they're doing, or it's a distress deal and we just have to get them out. They, they've got to try to preserve as much as they can of that deal by not overpaying, but they've also got to get the right work. So it's like, it's like when you're pricing anything else, like, you know, what's the right whatever for the, for the job you're doing, right? You know what I mean? It's yeah. like, it's like when I bought my tools, I didn't spend a lot of time looking at them because I didn't plan on using much of them at the house. You know, I hire people for everything. But if you're, um, you know, if if that's your business, you better pick the right one. I'm just saying it depends. You know, it it cost is part of it. And I think, you know, just run into New York City or, or Philadelphia, you could theoretically be in a position where you're going to pay way too much to sell your business. For lack of a better term, you, you may not be able to afford it. Mm. So you got to find something you can afford, but I think you got to find a, a quality that that they're going to get the job right. So why shopping? I guess is the yeah. way I would say it. You know what I mean, Bob? It's no, and I and I and I. One of the critical issues that I get with you know, Paul's law firm is a great law firm. There's other great law firms in Pennsylvania, but when when the client first starts off with what's your fees, mm. I would raise a red flag because they're shopping price. Mm -hmm. Not shopping the value proposition that comes with it. You know, my first question would probably be to Paul. Paul, what deals have you done in my range? The my type of industry? How deep is your team? Those type of things, and not worry about price. Mm -hmm. Same thing happens with the CPAs. I mean, the, the, I'm I'm past the accounting background too. What, what irritates me with accounting is audits became a commodity. They never needed to be a commodity. There's yeah. a value there that goes beyond commoditizing that service mm -hmm. and. You know, I think the selling the value proposition, whether we're selling it or delivering it, and the best way to deliver it is references too. I mean, I think if if I I, I refer Paul's firm a fair amount, and I'm very comfortable saying, you know, this is experience we've had with Paul's firm. I mean, he represented an Amish guy, um, a buyer of an Amish company, hardwood flooring manufacturer. I mean, the books and records were a challenge there. The, the schedules were a challenge. To put that together, but it came out to be a win-win for everybody involved there, and and so, you know, having references of, is is a good place to go. But I don't think people should be focusing on. They, obviously, they want to be careful if they go to a New York and Philly firm. I mean, Paul knows this story. We had a deal we did in Scranton two, three years ago. There were forty-five attorneys on the first intro call to kick off due diligence. Wow. And it was on Zoom. So just till you got to the introductions going across Zoom, Are you how serious? much legal fees were there just oh, to yeah. charge it for the introduction? <laughs> yeah. It was a public company that was buying somebody, so they paid the legal fees, but it was mm -hmm. So actually, I think it was December. Scott and I had a really nice meeting with an attorney down in Scranton who talked about how he walked a, a, a business owner right up to the finish line. And at the last minute, the 11th hour, the, the, the guy basically said, you know what? I, I don't really want to sell my business. And, and part of it was maybe this catches you guys by surprise. Maybe you're not surprised by it. He said, I don't know what I'm going to do. He was young. Hmm. And he said, I, I don't want to be one of those guys sitting – 
you know, at a, at a country club somewhere with money in the bank, but nothing to do than other than tell people that I used to be really good at something. And so psychologically, they weren't prepared. And so, Scott, I guess, I mean, going back to the planning, I mean, isn't that your role to sit there and say to that person, like, number one, are you ready? What are you going to do after? I know we do a lot of counseling for retirement saying, you know, what's that next chapter look like? It doesn't mean you can't retire. Some, a lot of people can are financially just fine, but mentally they're not prepared. We yeah. had a couple of folks on our our TV show or our radio show, as you like to call it, Paul, on this podcast talking about it. it took them a long time to adjust to that next yeah. chapter. Um, isn't it your, isn't it the role of the planner to get them to that? And, and is that shock you guys that somebody might pull out for that reason at the end? No, no, uh, no. I, I find it's even worse with a family owned business. Mm -hmm. They That's feel like they they feel like they're selling their sort of like the family, you know, the family unit. Yeah. It, they feel like a sense of, of, of they're almost being disloyal and the everything legacy else. Is going yeah, on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's funny. It's like you're, when you're advising everybody, you also have to understand your client, I think, on everything else and where they're coming from. And, and it's not always only money. Yep. Right. And so there's an emotional mm -hmm. component, especially with selling a business, especially at the end of your career. I've had people get, and I'm recently I've been talking to a client about how worried they are about their community because the community is one that sort of relies on the business how like half of what we've been doing in the in the deal is trying to find ways to lock the buyer into staying in that locale which isn't the easiest thing in the world no. to do mm. and so you know there's all sorts of motivations like he feels like he owes it to his community yep. or someone else feels like they owe it to their family or they have personal reasons like i'm just not ready so that's a big part of it and the psychological part is also part of the reason you should plan ahead and and not spend a fortune like if you really don't want to do it do that soul searching earlier when you sit with scott rather than you when you've got about you know tens of thousands of dollars worth of fees and you've paid mm -hmm. for evaluation you've paid for qov you've done all these things that's right. probably not the time you want to decide you don't feel like you can sell your business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah sometimes it takes that though to, to get them yeah. to that point because you know you get that email and it's you know this big number and it says i want to buy your company for this much and you get excited about it and you start mentally going down the road of like what would that be like if i got that much money and i could do all this stuff and i wouldn't have to go to work every day and then you you get three months down that process and all of a sudden it's you know put put your signature on this piece of paper and it gets really hard to move your hand because yeah. you're like wow that's you know I was thinking about all the good stuff, but now as I'm about to sign this form, I start thinking about all the stuff I'm giving up. And uh, we had a conversation with a, a colleague of ours uh, who was saying, you know, I, I don't have founderitis. I, I would sell my business in a minute. And I thought, I, I have founderitis. I, Bob, and, Bob and I have been you know, building the Stonehouse brand and, and Ben is part of that now too um, for 20, 20 plus years, 22 years now. And, you know, there's a lot of me in this and a lot of my identity wrapped up in the company. And it's hard to, you know, I could make that leap if I had to, but I don't perceive myself doing that. I, Bob and I have had conversations like, what would we do without Stonehouse? And uh, I don't think any of us plan to go anywhere for, yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah, yeah, we're here for, for a long time uh, because uh, it's, you know, part, it's our hobby, it's our interest, it's our, you know, we've spent a lot of time building what we've built so far. And so I, I definitely get that, um, you know, that process where it's got to be very frustrating for you guys to get that, you know, 50, 75% of the way through. And then all of a sudden somebody's like, no, I, I just can't sign the contract. It's good. Well, and you can't Scott, have we've, a legal we found that it, not just you asking that question, us asking that question more than once. Yeah. And asking the accountant and the attorney asking the question, and collectively, if it gets asked enough times, they're going to refine their answer and maybe decide not to do it early on before you spend a lot of time with it. Sure. We ask them to put a wish list together, too, mm -hmm. before we go to market. And that wish list could be things like back to community type things or – we want to keep all the employees or things along those lines. That often prompts them to start thinking, well, maybe I don't want to do that too. We find it more in uh, when the owners are in their early, late 70s or early 80s, not the younger ones. The younger mm -hmm. ones are like serial entrepreneurs. They'll do something else. Sure. It's the 80-year-old uh, that has nothing and really no family mm -hmm. to speak yeah. of. And until there's a health issue, they're going to they're gonna work to yeah. their 
the drop over. Need a reason to go to the office. And in, in your industry, we see it a lot with with old RAAs mm, yeah. that work till they die, yeah. and and then the clients already left. Sure, uh, and it gets to be you know the company's not worth anything anymore. Don't let that happen. <laughs> Don't let that <laughs> happen <laughs> to you guys. Well, that's well, that's well, that's well, me. You got like one foot in there. That's more than just a bite. That's a lot of a yeah. lot of small town professional <laughs> industry is that yeah. way. Yeah. And, yeah. And, and and I see a lot of transactions actually in the small town professional space that will that will blow up over the key employee mm -hmm. because it's not guaranteed that they're going to be retained and they're right. like if yeah. you're not going to keep them you're not getting it right. you know? mm -hmm. and i've i've seen that plenty of times where where they've had someone working by their side for 35 years yeah. and they're like if you're not if they don't have a job there's no nothing for you to buy yep. mm -hmm. um, definitely um, yeah. so there's a lot of emotion involved in that in that level and there should be yeah. You know, you've, you've put your soul into it for a long time. But you have to be a little bit careful because, you know, that buyer is going to have a ton of money invested. And if you walk away for like no reason when the, you're really near the close to the end, people do get sued over that. I don't know if you've ever seen it, Bob, but increasingly like, you know, there's an obligation to, to negotiate in good faith. And if you get too far down the road and you walk away for almost nothing, mm. you could get sued. I mean, I'm mm. not saying it'll be successful, but you could because sometimes they have a lot of money into it. And mm. then sometimes mm -hmm. you buy your way out of it. We've had people do that where they just say, we'll pay your, we'll pay your expenses just so, you know, we don't have a lawsuit about whether we should keep going. So, <laughs> you know, lawyers ruin everything. I've told you that many times, Bob. <laughs> it's your job, I think. Yeah, we try. <laughs> um, hey, so we're all right. We're pulling up on one and a half hours here. Before I let you guys go, though, if, if you have a few more minutes, um, can we talk about the types of buyers? Uh, Bob, you you listed about five different categories. Private equity uh, was one that obviously stood out to me. Strategic buyer, family, right? But we talked about sure. this earlier too. Um, what? How do we categorize these things? I mean, I'm trying to figure out where do you want to go in, in just maybe the next 10 minutes, <laughs> but that's, that's such a wide door. But I guess I'm going back. The one thing that really, in the very beginning, Paul, you mentioned you had kind of a 50-50 representation of buyers and sellers, and now mm -hmm. recently it's more 80-20. You're, you're representing a lot of sellers. I'm assuming that's mostly because PE, private equity, is coming in. Is that is that a fair I assumption? I would say that's that's – that's been a part of what's come up in recent years. I, we've, we've had private equity um, came around here or there, but I would say that, you know, as time went on, not unlike anything else, I think they expanded, private equity expanded the types of things they were looking to buy. Mm -hmm. I think things that you would expect them to buy in the past um, were more like manufacturing, things mm -hmm. like that, Bob. And then like, you know, in recent years, because they're looking for more things to buy, you know, service industries, right? You'd see like a platform get set up by a private equity firm where they were buying up engineering firms, for instance. Or, or you know, transportation might have been something you think about in the past. And they also, you know, there was more private equity firms. So then smaller targets, you know, we used to see when we had a private equity deal, it would usually be a much bigger deal. Mm -hmm. We've had some private equity deals that have been on the smaller side, like, you know, like less than five million sometimes. Mm -hmm. That's the difference I see. And that's what's led to more sales in my experience. Because when private equity with all this money around, there's just more buyers. Mm -hmm. Used to be like strategic buyers. There was like five or six people in your industry. You'd think like, well, someday if I sell, one of us will talk to each other and that'll right. mostly be probably what happens. But then when all this private equity came around, it was like, there's just more buyers. That was combined with the other reason for the sales, I think in my mind is, because of the graying of society, mm. it's just people hit, mm -hmm. you know, that all these baby boomers got to a point yep. where because of health or or whatever else, they just couldn't operate their business anymore. Mm. And the next generation didn't want to take it over. So things that in the past we'd be talking about succession of a family-owned business down to the next generation turned into selling. And so to me, those two factors together mm -hmm. really led to an increased number of sales. And that's changed it from 50-50 to 80-20. That's rough on the napkin sort of math. But we see a lot of sales, especially in um, in our area. Uh, I just think that's kind of likely to continue for those factors. You seeing the same thing, Brian? Yeah, and I think you touched, well, there's three and a half trillion in dry powder with private equity just in the U.S., not counting Canada and the rest of the world. So that's, mm -hmm. that's an awful lot of dry powder. 
couple that with family offices now that have really mm -hmm. stepped into the private equity space and search funds, which are a little less liquid than private equity is, but they're also in the market now too. And the strategic buyers out there as well. But I think the aging of the, the baby boomer transitions are still going to happen. And that could be third party sales or not. It could be internal too. But yeah, there, last year, I would say we were about 70% 70, 70 private equity mm -hmm. in our okay. transactions and, and probably the rest were all strategic. And so the interesting things about the private equity, uh, just mm -hmm. to give a little background on that, they're, it's basically large pools of money put together from millionaires and billionaires, and then they hire a team to go out and acquire firms without the intention of operating them in most cases. For the most part, there are there are operating private equity firms out there too that might have been in some industry mm -hmm. and uh, you know, fire and safety, for example, they mm -hmm. might have been in that industry, non-competes up, they partner with a private equity firm as, a, as an executive on the team, and they'll invest some of their own money and buy that that type of uh, industry. You know, Paul touched on uh, engineering firms. There's more and more engineering firms owned by private equity than I was surprised with. Mm. And uh, yeah. those are operating people mm -hmm. with a PE, with a private PE equity back, background. Uh, but you know, Paul touched on it. They're, they're, they expanded to what they look at. I mean, it used mm -hmm. to be the same thing. I get 30 emails a week from private equity. We want $2 million plus in EBITDA, recurring revenue, no customer concentrations, mm -hmm. and the leadership team is still in place. Well, you know, They all look the same. Differentiate yourself. So they have done that. Mm -hmm. But I, my first note of that was I was in Dallas for a, a private equity conference, mm -hmm. taking an Uber out to dinner with one of the PE guys. And I just bought – Five landscape landscape companies, mm. landscape company that doesn't feel like a private equity type deal. They see it as recurring revenue, though. Mm. You have to get you know, especially down south. So even like pool supply and pool maintenance companies, I never thought that would be mm. a PE sure. type interest, but we're seeing a ton of those. But mm -hmm. they're you know trucking companies. They used to be afraid of trucking. Now they're in trucking. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's they've expanded their yeah. what they're willing to do. Yeah, and deal and, sizes are smaller. They probably have a more streamlined. Well, way they'll do add-ons at zero. Mm. EBITDA, if it's a fit in their in their mm. organization, yeah. if they can make it accretive, and and you know, or even down to five hundred thousand dollars in EBITDA, and there's smaller PE firms out there that are a little bit of financing dependent, but they'll go down to that seven fifty five hundred thousand dollar EBITDA type type yeah. transaction. So, yeah. it's um, you know, we we had a PE bioelectrical contractor last year mm. shocked the daylights out. I mean, they would go after a small non recurring revenue electrical contractor. Yeah. No pun intended. I'm sure. Yeah, it's just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know um, the 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 thing about the diff when you're differentiating buyers and you what you guys talked to them up front about what you're going to want. You know, if they're if the concept of rollover equity is something they mm. have no appetite for, especially yeah. if they're older or something like that, it might change who Bob might say is the right buyer. Sure, strategics are way more likely to not have rollover equity. Mm. Not always. Sometimes they have it, but it's less frequent. Private equity, you know, Bob mentioned that, you know, sometimes they ask you to do it. I've been involved with a lot, especially in the service industry, where that's been a requirement of mm. the deal. Yeah. And they push you See to that. have sometimes more rather than less rollover equity. One, you and have issue, skin in the game after the sale so that you have reason to make the stock to go up. Well, there's a couple of reasons. I mean, partly they might not want to come out of pocket with that much no, cash yeah, at the true. time too, but you know, rollover equity has its share of issues, but it can be lucrative because mm -hmm. when they recap and they go to the next sale right. and you're part of that equity, that yeah, could really be a helpful, multiple, yeah. but you have almost no control. I mean, Bob and his team yeah. do a good job, and we try to do the same to try to get as many protections as you can. But unless you have a lot of leverage, it's not a, it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And so, as you look at strategics and 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 private equity, and candidly, ESOPs have made a comeback. I mean, ESOPs hmm. you'd never heard of them for years, really happening with much frequency. More and more, you know, employee stock ownership plans have come to be where. We hear more and more people trying to do it, and it's because if they can't get interest from some of these other sources, it's a it's an exit strategy, mm -hmm. and that's what a lot of this is is you know just finding an exit from the business. And so we've had some people go down that route. It, yeah. It's interesting with 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 ESOPs, we're seeing PE firms buy a company and then grow it, fix it, and then sell to an ESOP hmm. as well, yeah. but building a team behind it, and it's because it's. Um, it's a little bit surprising. I've been seeing more of that too. Yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. You wouldn't expect that. Yeah. Um, 
I guess what this boils down to for me is is flexibility. I, we always joke about in our videos, the F word is flexibility in our business. Um, at least that's what we call it here. Uh, the more flexibility somebody can have in their retirement plan, in their business, uh, their exit strategy. You know, I can't predict what three years out is for, for anybody, let alone five, 10 or, or past that. So if I'm just kind of wrapping up, because I know you guys have been, I really appreciate some of you guys, Bob and Paul drove quite a ways. Do you, if I'm sitting here listening to this conversation, <clears throat> excuse me, and and I'm thinking I it's time for me to sit up straight and start paying attention, um, what do I do? Do I do I call one of you guys and start the process, and then you, you you'll take a look? Should I go right to my financial planner? And I'm sure you're all going to say. Come, they should Come call me. me. First. <laughs> it really doesn't matter. But I mean, what, can I do? Can I? Is there a wrong step I might take? Or I mean, any step is probably toward planning is a good step. I would say that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. Especially if you have a good team, they'll get the other people involved, right? right? So next professional you're speaking to, you know, talk to them about it. But if not, you know, call any of us. I think it's if you have the right team together. Ben's not going to wait long before he says you should talk to Bob or you should talk to Paul. Or you, should, you know, mm-hmm. and that's the same way we are. I mean, you know, I almost every email I send out to somebody is make sure you look at have, have your tax advisor look at this because mm-hmm. they need they know more. Tax advisors know more about businesses than almost anybody because you guys deal with them more mm-hmm. and and your investment advisor the way you guys do it. You know more about the business than anything. You probably, you know, went to their child's baptism and everything else. You know, <laughs> you guys get to know your clients you really well. Game. Yeah. <laughs> but, but you know, the same thing with Bob. I just think, you know, making, starting the process, because it is a process, and getting, you know, starting to think about it. And and it and it's sometimes it comes in fits and starts because everybody's busy. So you start the process and then you make sure you keep getting after it. But the sooner you do it and the better prepared you are for this, when that email comes in with that big number, you're ready to do it. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's the most important thing. And if I were talking to any business owner out there, I would just say it's too important. You've put too much effort into it not to do the things you need to do to get the most money out mm-hmm. of it. And that's, that's my view. Of it's it. important to remember that you are going to need a team. So if you go to your trusted professional, you go to your accountant, he says, I'll just handle it all for you. Don't worry about it. It's probably not a good option for you. And you're, you're oh, going to need flag. other teams. Yeah, that'd be yeah. a red flag. Yeah. yeah. And so maybe look around <laughs> for other trusted professionals that you might be able to, that might work on a team because there's no way for any of us to know all of the things that are involved in all the pieces here. And so you're going to have to have four, five, six, seven people sometimes around the table to make these things happen. People regularly say to me like, well, you know, how much do you think my company's worth? I go, I have no idea. Yeah, Call yeah, Bob. Yeah. And then yeah, they'll say I'm like, well, what do you think I'll end up out of this? I go, I really have no idea because I don't know all your <laughs> circumstances. Call Ben. Yeah. It really is completely different kind of disciplines, but mm-hmm. they all work together. So it's important to have the right team. Agree. And it's, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, hunting for the lowest fee and why that doesn't make sense. But what you don't want to do is finish one of these transactions and have regret. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. You put your life's work into this thing that you built and then you, you save some fees to sell it for far too low and have that thought in the back of your mind. Right. right. You, you don't want to carry that. You want to do it right. You want to get the most value that you can out of your out of your work um, and, and feel good about what you've done. Uh, yep. So call your professionals. Mm, agree. I agree with everything you said. And, uh, <laughs> nice I think, though, right. asking your professional, the first one you talked to, what kind of experience do you have with this? Mm-hmm. And what the people that are referring mm-hmm. to, what kind of experience do they have? Mm-hmm. Um, if they do, back to that legal example that we recently had, if they did one deal a year in M&A and have never done a deal in over $20 million to a private equity firm, they're not going to be the right, probably the right firm. And they may be the right firm to help them with some parts of this, but they're, you know, Paul can overlay himself or, or a similar attorney like Paul on top of that too. But getting to the right professionals, um, a good, a good profile. Um, uh, if somebody tells me to sell a TV station, I don't know how to sell a TV station, mm-hmm. but I, with being active in my industry, I knew who to find. Mm-hmm. And that's the right, you know, getting yeah. to the right professionals. If you're focused on the client, client centered, you'll get to the right people. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say to kind of wrap it up as I as I'm looking around the room here in the semicircle in front of me here, like it starts with, you know, how much do you think I need to mm-hmm. be able to? Am I at that point where I could extract enough value and live comfortably, 
and and then my next as I'm looking at you, Bob, is I want to get the best value I can. Doesn't always necessarily mean the highest price, right? right? There's a lot of other things that are part of that package deal. And then I look at Paul. I want to make sure that every I's dotted and T is crossed, and I come out of this bulletproof, if you will. And, and then I look at Ben, and I think I want to pay the least amount of taxes <laughs> on the way into it, on the way out of it. Yeah. And then I kind of go back to you, Scott. For yeah. You know, and when it's all done. I want to be able to not run out of yeah. money. Stress-free. Yeah. 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 You're not selling your business to be stress-free your entire yeah. retirement. So you want to have a stress-free retirement after you sell. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of people, uh, the accountant, virtually everybody has an accountant or tax preparer. And that is kind of the front door for a lot of people to enter these types of relationships. Probably second most being the financial advisors they encounter. But a lot of people don't have a good corporate attorney on on file or or a business transition planner. Well, um, and Scott, even the accountant's more than just taxes. No, oh, correct. Because yeah. it's going to help Paul with the reps and warranties if, it, if he does yes. a good job, mm -hmm. or he or she does a good job, and also things like escrow related to the escrow agreements and things that come back to haunt you, sales tax issues, working capital issues. Sure. I mean, it's more than just tax that a good CPA will add value to a transaction. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Guys, I can't believe I'm, I'm, we've never had five people in the studio, and I think all <laughs> cameras are still running. I, hope so. <laughs> I, I, I ran out of cameras. I had to get my old iPad here. So um, <laughs> it worked. And it looks like our, our audio is working too. So I can't thank you both or both all of you enough. Um, again, I know you guys drove some time uh, and put some time in. You guys have a ton of experience on these topics and it's been great. I'd love to do part two, mm. but uh, I really appreciate this one. This was, this means a lot. That'll be great. Let's try Thank to you. do a part yeah. two. Yeah. Yeah. I like being down here. It feels like Wayne's world. It's awesome. Yeah, it does feel a little <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'll do the whole thing. You know, I dressed up as Garth for Halloween back oh. in college. It was a big hit, but that was 30 some years ago. <laughs> <laughs> the reference right. died a long time ago. Yeah, yeah, you can't get right. away with Thank that you. anymore. Thank you. Thanks for having Thank us. You very much. Appreciate Thank you. it. All right. Yeah.